Well, good evening all. Nice to see you. Uh, we're talking about the Oedipus effect, uh, derived, of course, from uh, Sophocles' great tragedy written about two and a half thousand years ago, about uh, the man who is, uh, is told by the oracle that he is fated to kill his father and marry his mother. And, of course, he's so freaked out by this that he relocates himself as far away from home as possible. He thinks, I'd better put a bit of distance between myself and my parents. On the road, he has a, a, a sort of a, a chariot road rage incident with a stranger that he meets on the road, kills him, and of course he later turns out to be his biological father, and uh, goes on to Thebes, marries Queen Jocasta, and uh, of course she turns out to be his mother, because what he didn't realise was that the parents he was distancing himself from were foster parents. Uh, that's the rough outline of the plot, a bit oversimplified. Actually, Tom Lira expresses it very well in that song, which you, you may have heard back in the 50s. He wrote that comic song about it. Now, since that time, uh, a lot of writers have seen profound significance in the Oedipus legend. Um, one of them, of course, was Richard Wagner, and that's a quote from him. Today we need only expound faithfully on the myth of Oedipus according to its inmost essence, and we in it win an intelligible picture of the whole history of mankind. That's what he wrote uh, back in 1851 in his prose writings. And incest themes, of course, appear in his operas. Now, Freud famously made the Oedipus complex the centerpiece of his psychoanalytic theory, the idea is that uh, small boys uh, of around a, a certain age, sort of four or five typically, feel sexual desire for their mother, combined with a kind of hostility uh, to their father, and uh, a subsequent fear of the father retaliating uh, and thus creating castration anxiety. And there is a female equivalent of that, uh, which Jung actually dubbed the Electra complex. Uh, much the same, except that castration anxiety is replaced by penis envy. Now, in Freud's theory, a failure to resolve this Oedipus complex uh, results in a fixation and what he called inverted sexuality, which, of course, we recognize as homosexuality. Now, these notions are very difficult to test scientifically, and the essence of science, of course, is to be able to falsify a hypothesis. It's hard to do because uh, these complexes in psychoanalysis are supposed to operate unconsciously, so no point in asking anybody whether they feel hostility towards their father, for example. Uh, and on top of that, if you do find something that seems contrary to the, to the theory, you can always discount it as being due to reaction formation or some kind of defensive process that will nullify or uh, invert, as a good Freudian word, the, um, the original hypothesis. We know uh, pretty much now that the Freudian theory of homosexuality is wrong because um, sex orientation seems to be determined uh, by the time of birth, by a combination of um, genetics and uh, prenatal hormones. So not much is, is left for the Oedipus complex on that front. Freud himself became progressively grandiose about uh, the importance of the Oedipus complex. And there's a quote from Totem and Tabu back in 1918, the beginnings of religion, morals, society and art converge in the Oedipus complex. Uh, a bit of a restatement of the quote from Wagner, as a matter of fact, and leads one to think that maybe Wagner was one of Freud's uh, inspirations. The anthropologists got in on the act, uh, debating the question of whether the Oedipus complex was a cross-cultural universal or whether it depended on the family arrangements operative in that particular society. Uh, Bronislaw Manis Mal Malinowski, uh, of course, was a very famous anthropologist 
who um, went to the Trobriand Islands off the northeast coast of New Guinea and reckoned that uh, he could not find the Oedipus complex there uh, because they did not have uh, a triangular family arrangement of the kind that we, uh, we recognize. And uh, Malinowski decided that uh, Oedipus complex did not appear in what he called matrilineal societies, such as the Trobriands. A later anthropologist, Melford Spiro, uh, went back to the Trobriands and he uh, wrote an entire book to um, substantiate the idea that the Oedipus was uh, alive and well in the Trobriands and that Malinowski had been wrong and he came to the conclusion that it was universal. Now, these disputes uh, have been going on in anthropology ever since, and I think they're ultimately futile because the theory itself uh, is insufficiently clear in its predictions. Now, of course, uh, Freudian ideas have permeated the arts, and uh, this is a production of Hamlet, back in 1937 originally, filmed a bit later, uh, which took inspiration from uh, Ernest Jones' interpretation of Hamlet as a man who is blocked by um, his Oedipal complex from uh, his, his Oedipal conflict by, uh, with respect to killing his stepfather. And... Uh, in this particular production, the Tyrone Guthrie production, uh, the, Hamlet's mother is a very youthful-looking woman, uh, played, in fact, by an actress who was 13 years junior to Olivier himself. Incest themes were much more explicit in some other works, such as Wagner, uh, Sigmund and Sieglinde, for example, are um, long-lost brother and sister who are instinctively drawn to each other. And uh, the end of the first act uh, of De, De Valkyrie, the curtain comes down just about in time <laughs> to prevent you seeing a, a rather explicit uh, bit of lovemaking between the, the twin brother and sister. And incest is uh, appearing increasingly in TV series such as Boardwalk Empire, uh, The Borgias and Game of Thrones are some that uh, come to mind as featuring incest themes. Here's another one, Star Wars, Luke and Leia are... Uh, in love before they discover that Darth Vader is father to both of them and that they are, in fact, twins. So she has to go off with Harrison Ford instead after that. Uh, now, what is very clear is that there's an element of truth in this um, Oedipus complex idea, which is that uh, when people have been separated from their families uh, as infants and they rediscover their biological relatives uh, in adulthood, they often experience uh, what has been described as a lightning bolt romantic and sexual attraction. It's sometimes called genetic sexual attraction, but the word genetic is a little misleading because there's nothing genetic about it. It's almost certainly determined by experiences after birth. It is an environmental effect, probably. Uh, and uh, it can occasionally lead to incestuous sexual relationships. Uh, always in instances, it seems, when the, um, the individuals have been separated and rediscover each other after a long period of time. It's described as a feeling of recognizing oneself in the other, and sometimes they talk about being half in love with the idea of meeting that uh, long-lost relative before the, the actual encounter. But uh, these encounters are occurring more and more often now since the laws have been relaxed with respect to chasing up relatives post-adoption. There are some real-life examples of the phenomenon, apart from Luke and Leia and Star Wars. In 1984, there was an incident where a woman in Tennessee 
was actually um, on a charge of having married her 19-year-old son, whom she had given up for her adoption as a baby. Now, both of the individuals claimed that this was unwitting, that they were not aware of the relationship, but uh, they were probably trying to uh, avoid serious legal consequences because it uh, turned out that the mother at least knew that it was her son. We're not so sure about the other way around. Uh, Mother-son is very unusual, of course. Uh, Brother-sister unions are much more common. Um, As I say, increasingly so, as we are given the opportunity to rediscover um, long-lost relatives. Although some of them, of course, we may never find out (laughs) that uh, it it was uh, a case of incest if uh, if the adoption records are not made available to them. Uh, chance encounters are increasingly possible in the modern age where you might have uh, sperm banks uh, in a local area where one man is effectively servicing uh, a a large number of of females in that neighbourhood. A couple of uh, examples of siblings that have lived together Uh, Very often, despite being jailed intermittently, they still say that uh, they have no intention of of giving up their relationship. And uh, this German couple, I think, now have two children together. Uh, And the Essex couple have at least one baby. There are prohibitions against uh, incest in most societies. They're very often backed up by laws and punishments. Uh, They apply most forcibly with respect to parent-child relationships where there is an element uh, of potential child abuse thrown on top of the the charge of incest. Uh, This chap is an eminent Columbia University politician Uh, who was uh, actually admitted having a consensual sexual relationship with his daughter. And his argument was, well, you know, you used to have a problem with homosexuality, but now that they're consenting uh, adults, nobody seems to mind. What is wrong with me having a consensual adult relationship with my own daughter? And uh, they seem to have kind of uh, half accepted that argument because... uh, the, uh, it was a, effectively a rap over the knuckles that he got. He was conditionally discharged, and he even managed to retain his job at Columbia University. Uh, brother-sister relationships are a great deal uh, more common, uh, and uh, the prohibitions against that are um, highly variable from one part of the world to another. Uh, In some parts of the world, all forms of brother-sister relationship are um, are completely banned. Um, There are exceptions, like um, the Egyptian kings in ancient times uh, were said to sometimes marry their sister as a means of maintaining uh, the dynasty and consolidating power and property. Uh, More often... um, you have outbreeding as a form of building political alliances, as in the time of King Henry VIII. You would be expected to marry royalty in some other country in order to to build a military or political alliance with them. Uh, Cousin marriage, the laws are even more variable. In some places, uh, it's not a problem. In, In the United States, for example, about half the states make it illegal and about half do not. When people do make it illegal, sometimes it applies only to what they call parallel cousin marriage, which is uh, where, say, you, you marry your father's brother's daughter might be acceptable, but marrying your father's sister's daughter is not. <laughs> That's called um, sort of cross-sex sex, uh, incest. Uh, so there are uh, variations like that. And there are a number of Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, the Samaritans, uh, actually promote cousin marriage. And uh, Pakistanis, particularly in Britain, more than half of um, British Pakistani marriages are cousin 
marriages, about 55%, I believe. And uh, some people have said that this is creating problems with uh, the accumulation of um, <coughs> recessive genes that are potentially detrimental to the offspring. Now, there's another anthropologist, Westermark, uh, going back uh, pre-Freudian days, really. He reckoned that he had observed that incest does not naturally occur either in non-human animals or humans, and that what uh, is built up as an inhibition against it is close, intimate proximity with your, um, your siblings and, and other family members. Uh, he observed that we don't tend to get sexually excited by people we have been raised with, whether they're blood relatives or uh, completely unrelated. And uh, anthropologists more recently have looked at um, the kibbutz marriages, where they, um, they have a household that is very much bigger than the nuclear family that, uh, that we have in Britain, and uh, including many who are not related to each other, but the ones who have been raised within the same house uh, do not normally pair off sexually or in marriage. In fact, they observed... Uh, this chap observed uh, nearly 3,000 kibbutz. Oops. How do I say okay to that? <laughs> I don't seem to have enough. Uh... Can somebody cancel that message for me? Mm. It's gone? Okay. Right. Um. <coughs> Yes, um, very few relationships, either sexual or marriage relationships, occur in the kibbutz between people who had shared a home before the age of six. Uh, Lieberman et al. have uh, found that the longer the duration of a sibling co-residence, the more hostile to the idea of incest are those people, the more they will declare the whole idea of incest to be morally wrong. This uh, Westermark effect has presumably evolved as a proxy for kin recognition to protect us against inbreeding and the consequence um, being harmful recessives uh, accumulating and causing trouble, uh, as was the case with haemophilia in Queen Victoria's family. Now, the interesting thing about the Westermark effect is that uh, it applies to all species, or most species where you can identify similar processes, but it will fail if those relatives are raised separately, which, of course, was the case between Oedipus and Jocasta, the queen and mother that he married. In that sense, of course, uh, uh, the Westermark effect is uh, a powerful uh, predictor of behaviour, much more so than the Freudian uh, concept of the Oedipus complex, where it is presumed that it is natural to have uh, sexual drives towards close family members. Westermark said the opposite. Now, the Westermark effect is backed up by a number of other forces, one of which is the spatial dispersion of young males when they reach adolescence, in the case of baboons and non-human primates, the young males very often slope off to find uh, a new troop uh, with which they will not be overly related. Uh, teenage rebellion is a possible instance of this where, um, as we all know, uh, children in adolescence become difficult. If you've ever been a parent, you will know that. They, tend, they appear to pick rows quite gratuitously. They choose music, dress, piercings, tattoos and so on, anything that will alienate the parents. Uh, the whole criterion of a choice of music is that it will be something that your parents would hate. Um, it causes a lot of trouble, of course, between parents and, and their teenage children. Now, it's commonly interpreted as a striving for independence, and uh, indeed, in one sense it is, but it may also function to keep 
the, uh, the cross-sex parents at bay and hence reduce the risk of incest. Once past the, uh, the hormonal, hormonal years, then there is less of a need for such a mechanism. And um, once children are beyond the, uh, the teenage years, they tend to get on all right again with their parents. Now, it's known that in non-human animals, uh, the females tend to avoid social contact with male close kin at times when they are fertile. Uh, And this is an interesting study, Lieberman et al. uh, looked at mobile phone records of (laughs) adolescent girls, and they found that they were uh, about half as likely to call their father when they were ovulating, and if their father happened to call them, they would terminate the call twice as fast. (laughs) Uh, Now, it's... um, not just avoiding parental um, control generally, because they actually increased contact with their mother. So it's most likely um, an adaptation to avoid inbreeding that will um, stack up and support the the Westmark effect. Uh, Certainly it's not um, fertile women avoiding male contact in general, because um, studies of the dress and the gestures of uh, ovulating women show that they are more flirtatious. Uh, And uh, that's one particular study I saw recently showing that um, they are about three times as likely to wear the colours red and pink, uh, courtship colours, if you like, (laughs) titillating colours, while they are fertile than when not. In non-human animals, uh, the Westermark effect is primarily driven by uh, the olfactory mode uh, where animals will detect close kinship uh, by the smell of the other. There is this um, gene complex called the major histocompatibility complex which governs uh, the, the nature of the immune system Uh, and at the same time is detectable by smell by other members of the species. And the research shows that um, animals tend to prefer to mate with others who have different uh, immune systems, as indicated by the MHC uh, complex. Uh, And that makes sense because this would enable them to have a more heterogeneous uh, relationship which... um, would uh, broaden the immune spectrum of their offspring and have survival value. Now, at the human level, uh, it's a bit more complicated, at least the women are, because they tend to prefer men who have dissimilar uh, MHC when they are in breeding mode by which uh, the re- different research shows that they are mid-cycle, not taking the contraceptive pill, in a relationship with a, with a man, and not already pregnant. In all of those circumstances, they will prefer uh, men who are dissimilar in MHC. And incidentally, if they're coupled, it, it increases the likelihood of what is euphemistically called extra pair copulations. <laughs> infidelity, in other words. Uh, if they are not in breeding mode, then they tend to prefer familial smells, people who are closely related to themselves, because this will provide them with um, comfort and support. So it looks as though they are after good genes when they're fertile, even if they're not the genes of their uh, recognised partner. And uh, they would be looking for support and and safety in the form of family backup when they're not in the breeding mode. And uh, the importance of odour, particularly for female mate choice, uh, is indicated by a new uh, phenomenon called pheromone parties, where the partners are chosen by sniffing undergarments. (laughs) Uh, There's an example here. Uh, on the grounds that this way you're you're getting somebody uh, with whom you are 
compatible at the olfactory level rather than anything more superficial. <laughs> now, we know about the advantages of outbreeding and hybrid vigour and all that kind of thing, uh, but there are also certain advantages to inbreeding. For example, it prevents the breakup of or gene combinations that have proven themselves successful over a period of time. And the whole idea of inclusive fitness in evolutionary psychology is the idea that um, by uh, clubbing together with people to whom we are closely related, uh, we not only help our relatives, but we help our own genes because more of our own genes are contained within the relatives. This is the sort of the selfish gene concept. We help our own genes by, uh, even by marrying close relatives. And hence we prefer people similar to ourselves as partners and as friends. Uh, and uh, that way we are um, actually supporting or um, breeding with somebody who contains more than 50% uh, of genes the same as our own. So you've got uh, a balance that needs to be struck between the uh, advantages of inbreeding and the advantages of outbreeding, a concept of optimal outbreeding associated with Patrick Bateson, uh, who's uh, probably done most of the research on this idea, and with non-human animals, of course, mostly birds. Uh, it, of course, a range of successful strategies are possible, which is perhaps why we have all that um, cross-cultural variation and whether it's a good thing to marry your cousin. Uh, uh, these researchers, Rushton and Bonn, have uh, established that there is genetic overlap in the people that we form friendships with and choose as mates. And uh, they conclude that we must therefore have some mechanism for detecting our own genes in other people. Similarity detection. This, this would be a terrible mistake <laughs> if you thought that was a close relative, of course. <laughs> now, choosing a partner similar to yourselves um, might be a result of choosing somebody who looks like our opposite sex parent, or alternatively, we might be looking for somebody who looks as much like ourselves as possible on the grounds that um, I'm perfect, therefore all I need is an opposite sex equivalent of myself, uh, assuming heterosexuality, of course, which you can't always. Uh, before the advent of mirrors, this would involve looking at your reflection in the water and uh, seeking that uh, image externally. And, uh, of course, there's this quote from Wagner, the stream has shown my reflected face, and now I find it before me, in you I see it again, just as it shone from the stream. Uh, one of the lines where Sieglinde is falling in love with Siegmund in the Valkyrie on the basis of uh, recognising oneself in the other. Similar theme appears with uh, Papageno and Papagena in Mozart's Magic Flute, where Papageno always had in his head the idea that he had a perfect soulmate who would look exactly like himself, like a parrot, uh, except uh, a female equivalent. Now, there have been some uh, experimental studies of this phenomenon, uh, a lot of them uh, using very clever technology. Fraley and Marx, for example had uh, some students rate the sexual attractiveness of a hundred strangers' faces. For half of the, the subjects, the face was preceded by a subliminal quick flash of uh, the image of a close family member, whereas the controls were exposed to the relatives of somebody else, a subliminal flash of somebody else's close relative. And what they found was that the experimental group uh, rated the strangers as more attractive, the ones that carried a, a brief uh, priming of a, of a close relative. 
Then there's a second study in which they started to morph the faces so as to resemble their own face. And the greater the morphing towards themselves, the more attractive the face tended to be judged to be. Uh, so we're left with a couple of ideas about uh, what might account for, um, for choosing similar mates. It could be um, genetic relatedness itself or it could be resemblance to oneself. So how do we choose between the two? Uh, just before I answer that question, here's a, another study in which um, this group compared attractiveness ratings of one's own romantic partner morphed in different ways. Some of them were blended with one's own image. Here's an original picture of your partner. This one, uh, she's got a little bit of yourself included. Uh, this one, uh, we've got the addition of a female prototype, which is an average, typical female. And here, this one is made a little bit more typically male. Uh, now, what they found was that um, the one that is branded with the prototype tended to be preferred over the original by independent judges. But uh, the self-based morph, uh, the one that had a 22% amalgam of the self, was the one that was consistently preferred above all others by the individual themselves. Remember that they had three levels of blending with the self, and this was the one that was chosen as the preferred image of the partner. And that, uh, interestingly, turns out to be the highest level of resemblance that will operate without you being aware of what's going on. So it has to operate at a subconscious level. If it becomes too obvious, too intrusive, then uh, the, the benefits are lost. So we like a little bit of ourselves in our partners, it seems. <clears throat> Uh, here's another morphing study which uh, looked at the effect of sibling resemblance. In this particular study, uh, if they made uh, the potential mate to be more similar to themselves, it, uh, it didn't seem to affect judgments. But um, sibling blends, that is putting a little bit of your sister in if you're a, a male or a little bit of your brother in if you're a female... Uh, it did have an effect, but in opposite directions for men and women. The women tended to uh, rate pictures morphed with their brother to be less sexually attractive. A picture looking with your brother, uh, with, a, with a potential partner looking a little bit like your brother was a bit of a turn-off, whereas men it was the other way around. If they had an image that was sister-morphed, it tended to be rated as more attractive. Uh, and that is consistent with quite a bit of research that uh, supports the idea that the Westermark effect applies more powerfully for females than for males. And one presumes that this is because uh, the costs of getting reproduction wrong are greater for females than for males. Inbreeding has greater costs for females, and hence they are are more averse to incest. There's another one of the Sky Atlantic series that is uh, getting in on the, the idea that incest is an entertaining concept, that it uh, sparks powerful feelings in people one way or another, whether it be uh, excitement or uh, repulsion, or some mixture of the two. There's another morphing study here um, showing that uh, whether or not we like somebody who has family resem resemblance depend upon whether we're looking for somebody for the long term or a short term fling. Uh, these, the researchers are De Bruin, and uh, this is an example of their work. This individual finds uh, C 
more trustworthy than B because C has got a bit of her own face morphed into it. Now, I don't know whether you can see that, but uh, if you put those face, two faces together, you come close to this one. So A rates C as a more trustworthy individual because they recognize a bit of themselves in it. However, uh, it did not uh, increase their sex appeal um, overall. But where short-term flings are concerned, uh, self-resemblance actively decreased sexual desirability. Uh, so, obviously, if, if you're looking for somebody for a short-term fling, there is more, uh, more breeding or... Um, Good genes, from your point of view, become more important. Uh, and hence, sex appeal is raised in, in somebody um, who does not look as though they are very closely related to yourself. If it's a long-term relationship, then there is a bit more value in having somebody who looks as though they're part of the family already. Uh, now, here's a study uh, by Keith Kendrick, who was a, a previous Gresham professor of physics uh, back in 2002 to 2006, I think it was, uh, a Cambridge um, scientist, now working in China, I think, and <laughs> last heard of. Uh, he did this cross-fostering studies, study in which um, lambs were raised by a goat mother and kids raised by a sheep mother. Sheep and goats, of course, are slightly related as species anyway. But uh, what Kendrick found was that uh, when the lambs raised by a goat mother grew up, they tended to fancy female goats uh, and vice versa. Those um, kids raised by a sheep would fancy female sheep when they grew up. The wrong species, if you like. Uh, but the effect was much more powerful for males than for females. Uh, consistent with the idea that uh, there is a visual imprinting aspect in male sexual attachments rather more than female. Or that, uh, that male sexuality is more targeting in its, in its nature and uh, the female sexuality more receptive. Uh, I think the effect did apply to females as well, but just less strikingly and was of marginal significance. Here's a study using uh, zebra finches. They were, um, zebra finches come in a variety of colours, but the ones in this study were all white in their plumage, but the beak colour was manipulated with nail varnish. <laughs> From Boots the chemist, probably. Uh, and uh, what they found was that um, if you were, uh, let's, let's look at this, uh, this group uh, were raised with a red beak mother, they're males raised with a red beak mother and an orange father. Uh, so they tended to prefer the red beaked female in adulthood. And vice versa here, these... Uh, Group O in the white were uh, raised with uh, an orange beak mother and uh, a red beak father. And they tended to go for the orange beaks, orange beaked females when they grew up. Now, how do you know uh, what color beak <laughs> a male zebra finch is fancying? Well, it's measured by the proportion of songs that they direct at, uh, at different females. They, uh, the finch will sing to, uh, to a potential mate in order to attract them. And uh, the singing is testosterone-driven. In other words, if you increase testosterone, they sing more and vice versa. Uh, the other interesting thing about the study is not just the... Um, the cross-sex thing, the Oedipal tendency to fancy uh, your mother if you're a male zebra finch, but, uh, but the fact that they went for super signals, exaggerated traits. 
uh, in that this was the original anchor point, but uh, if, if you were fancying an orange beak female, you would tend to go for very orange beak females. And here's the anchor point for the red beaks. That's what the mother, mother's beak was that hue. But uh, these boys went for even redder beaks than the mother that they'd been raised with. And, uh, of course, that is a potential uh, source of of sexual dimorphism, differences between uh, the sexes being uh, exaggerated, so that eventually you end up with a peacock's tail. So, let's uh, look at the Oedipal modelling studies at the human level. The first study that I discovered was using Hawaiians of mixed race. What this chap Jedlicker had observed was that um, if you had different race parents in Hawaii, say your father's Polynesian and your mother is Oriental, uh, then you will tend to go for the, uh, the ethnic group of the opposite sex parent rather than the same sex parent. And uh, I thought that was very interesting, and I extended it to eye colour. Back in 1987, you wouldn't think I'd been around that long, would you? Uh, (laughs) But I found that uh, when women fell in love with a man, they were tending to pick a chap who had the eye colour of their father more often than their mother. Very much parallel to the the Jedlika study of ethnic groups. Uh, I had also observed that um, uh, a girl whose father was quite middle-aged by the time she was born tended to fancy guys that were a bit older. And somebody else took that one up uh, specifically and found that daughters of older men were choosing older partners. Again, as though they're using the image of their father to, uh, as a template for choosing their male partner. Another study showed that people chose partners more similar to their opposite sex parent, not just in eye colour, which I'd already established, but in hair colour, even. Same sort of idea. And uh, then there was a study in which uh, people were matching photos of wives and mothers-in-law and were able to do so beyond a chance level. So uh, what I would conclude from that is that the self-image theory, that is picking somebody who looks like, just like yourself, is less powerful than the idea of, of a cross-sex uh, influence in your choices. That is using the opposite sex parent as a model rather than the same sex parent. Uh, Another recent study uh, just used facial metrics to establish the same thing. They were taking objective measures of various aspects of the face, and they found that men and women who were uh, together, married or otherwise, tended to be correlated uh, in most of those measurements. But they tended to correlate more with the partners, men correlated with the partner's father, not the mother, and women resembled the partner's mother, but not his father. They then went ahead and replicated that all again with similarity ratings of photographs, just backing up support for this idea that the opposite sex parent is being used as a template to guide your choice of a partner. Uh, A couple of celebrity examples for your amusement. Uh, This is Madonna, of course, and uh, she's had this um, very sort of dysfunctional relationship with the actor Sean Penn. Uh, They were married for some time. Uh, It was an abusive relationship, and they had an acrimonious divorce, but she still claims to be addicted to him, that she has very strong feelings for him still. And her brother Sean reckoned that Sean, uh, well, that's interesting for a start, that her brother's got the same name. <laughs> but, but this brother also claims that, oh, sorry, no, 
No, the brother was... I don't know what the brother's name was. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, the brother, whoever he was called, reckons that Sean was a ringer for their father, Silvio, up here. Now, you can judge for yourself whether that chap looks a bit like him. Something about the big nose and the long jaw, otherwise sort of narrow, elongated features. Uh, I suppose there's a certain similarity there, but anyway, uh, according to Madonna's brother, um, these two uh, are very much alike, particularly when he was the age uh, that um, Sean Penn is now. Uh, and this father apparently brought Madonna up alone after her mother had died, but uh, married the family housekeeper, which was greatly upsetting to Madonna and uh, might have something to do with her ambivalence towards him. Uh, both men, incidentally, are of Italian origin, which would account for some further similarity or, or some of the similarity. Now, there are other studies that show that uh, whether or not your partner preference is modelled on the opposite sex parent depends partly on your relationship with that other sex parent. Is it good or bad? Generally speaking, daughters who have good relationships with their father tend to choose partners that are more similar uh, than if they had a bad relationship with that father. And uh, the same applies, incidentally, to relationships with adoptive fathers. So it's, uh, it's not just the genetic effect, it is the experience of, of that uh, who is occupying the role of father, not just uh, who is your biological father. Uh, here's a particular individual case uh, of interest, which is quite complicated. Angelina Jolie was estranged from her father, John Voigt, for most of her life. Never forgave him for leaving her mother, I think. Uh, they were reconciled in uh, 2007, around about the time she started uh, a relationship with Brad Pitt, whom people say is the first bloke who looks remotely like her father, John Voigt. Um, she had a few other serious relationships before Brad Pitt, uh, one of them a woman, incidentally, uh, but none of them looked at all like Voigt until the, the time of the reconciliation. Oh, same thing applies in reverse as research to show that uh, if you have a good relationship with your mother, then you'll pick a partner who looks a little bit like her. Um, now, imprinting a pose applies not just to your mate preferences, but also your um, sexual preferences, what turns you on. And uh, apparently things, early experiences will link your uh, first stirrings of sexual arousal to sensory experiences, particularly visual and olfactory ones. Smell. Here's a rat study in which rats were suckled with their mothers, some of whom had uh, lemon-flavoured nipples and genitals. <laughs> uh, they'd, been, they'd treated them with citral, which is a, a lemon-smelling substance. Now, those rats, male rats, when they grew up, were sexually excited by lemon-smelling females, <laughs> more so than, than ordinary, normal, receptive female rats. Uh, here's a more human study here in which um, they found a few guys who were really turned on by lactating women and pregnant women. It's a particular fetish, not all that common. But uh, this was a study of men who had that preference. You can find them on the web these days. You can find people who like almost anything. And that's how they located these guys. And it turned out that what they had in common was that their mother had nursed younger siblings, whether male or female, when they were one and a half to five years old. They were the older sibling and they had observed their mother in pregnancy and uh, nursing so this must be the sensitive period, one and a half to five years old. 
And uh, it's, you also get sort of um, sexual scripts and preferences like, uh, like masochism can be imprinted. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the film uh, A Dangerous Method, but one of Jung's patients who became a colleague later on uh, was inviting him to thrash her because uh, she had been sexually excited by similar uh, treatment from her father. Uh, so the experience of motherly discipline can apparently create masochism in, uh, in males. Rather more common preference, I have to say, than uh, pregnancy and lactation. So here's a summary of it, that um, Freud's theory of the Oedipus complex do, does seem to have some elements of truth, uh, but um, it distorts the basic facts that incest avoidance is the default position, normally because you're raised with your close kin, uh, and that will emerge quite naturally. You don't need powerful uh, prohibitions, uh, taboos, as Freud would have called them, to, uh, to establish that, although they might be useful as a backup if you have not been raised. Uh, with those and, and uh, are told further down the line. Um, there is no evidence for cross-sex antagonism during the Oedipal years. There's, it has not been possible to establish that uh, five-year-old boys actually hate their father uh, or young girls hate their mother. You do get imprinting of parental stimuli, as quite a number of those studies have established, but this doesn't mean that we desire intercourse with our parents because, of course, uh, by the time we have grown up and the, the hormones are running, um, our parents no longer look like the blueprint for arousal that we have established. Uh, so that is what will prevent us continuing to fancy our, our parents. Uh, and my own position is that evolutionary psychology is a much better framework for understanding all of these phenomena, than is psychoanalysis. In fact, I would be inclined to agree with um, Hermann Ebbinghaus, who was a contemporary of Freud and compatriot, uh, a great experimental psychologist, who in his PhD thesis <laughs> wrote that, um, that what's true in Freud is not new, and what's new is not true. Uh, and that's pretty much the position. And I couldn't resist uh, finishing with this... Uh, Cartoon, which uh, reinforces that idea. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs>